robots ranging from like a, um, like a, a climbing robots to growing soft robots. And uh, Professor Yang, can you allow uh, Ali to share his screen if you can share yours? <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you, yeah, stage is yours, thank you. Excellent, so let me just uh, switch over to my presentation here in just uh, one second. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so can everyone uh, see this? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, making it to the the final presentation of the day. Um, hopefully, uh, since we're a little behind, I'll keep this a little bit on the shorter side. And also, I will say, um, hopefully, it will be relatively entertaining to keep to keep you uh, engaged. We have quite a few videos um, and such uh, uh, today. So. Um, so I'm uh, Elliot uh, Hawks from UC Santa Barbara. Um, and today I'm gonna be talking about um, my vine inspired robots. Um, so so uh, these are inspired instead of, you know, by animals, which a lot of our bio inspiration and robotics is from, um, we're looking at a plant inspiration, which um, a few people are doing and it has some interesting uh, implications. Um, and then particularly, we're gonna look at a, a new application of this robot um, that we're just uh, developing now. Um, Okay, so uh, in general, you know, we talk about starting with a problem and going to a solution and uh, probably the naive way to say it is it looks something like this. Uh, but as designers and roboticists, uh, we probably all know that this process looks a little bit more like this. Uh, and for today's talk, it's gonna be even one step more convoluted because we, we started with the problem, we eventually came to a solution, uh, but in doing that, we realized that our solution was maybe even better suited uh, to solve a second problem, right? So this is gonna be uh, the flow for today. So we're gonna go from our initial problem to uh, the solution, our vine robotic technology. And then from there, we're gonna introduce this new problem that was uh, presented to us and how we adapted our solution to, to solve this second problem. Okay, so that's our uh, visual uh, outline for, for the talk today. Um, and with that, I'm gonna go ahead and jump in uh, into the first problem that we, we set out to solve today. Uh, so, so we were looking at search and rescue applications. So a situation like this, maybe uh, after an earthquake or the collapsed building, and you're looking for, for survivors inside. And you can see this is really challenging. I mean, humans obviously can't get in there. Dogs are great at sniffing, but again, they can't really access it's, it's a really challenging uh, problem, and there's quite a bit of work in, in, in robotics looking at how to solve this. Um, and and this, was, this was the challenge we were, we were looking at to solve um, with, with our technology. Or, you know, this was the problem we set out to solve. Uh, and if you, if you uh, abstract this problem, you can kind of say, look, something like this. You know, you have a starting location, you have a target, and how do you get there, right? And the kind of animal bio-inspired solution looks something like this. You know, you have a small body and you want to move your body to the target. But this is obviously challenging if you have, you know, tight constraints and, and your the size, the your total body can't fit through in any of these um, obstructions. Now, obviously this type of modality though has been used in lots of uh, applications and different modalities, driving, flying, walking, hopping, right? So this is a well-explored modality of uh, robotic motion. But we, you know, ask, oh, well, is there, you know, a different way uh, of accessing these hard to, to get to locations? And um, if you look uh, really across kingdoms, um, there is a, a different type of movement, uh, which is tip growth. So, so you start with a body and you extend down uh, into your environment. So uh, on the left is uh, neurons lengthening through uh, mammalian bodies to, or, or uh, animal bodies to innervate limbs, for instance, or plants uh, growing pollen tubes uh, into flowers. Um, these are just a couple examples. Uh, a little larger scale, something maybe slightly more familiar is uh, vines, right? So this is a sped up video of a vine growing. And when you speed them up, you actually see that this motion well, it kind of looks like something that might be useful um, uh, in terms of um, uh, growth or accessing these locations, right? 
So if we go back to our abstraction and we say, okay, well, what does this look like um, in, in our little drawing here? Well, so now we, we start with our, our base, our starting point. And instead of moving it forward, we're gonna extend it uh, from the tip, okay? And if you look at these stripes in this little sketch, you can see, well, the red one stays put and then we're adding new colors uh, as we go. And what's interesting about that is the body is actually stationary. Uh, and so as you're squeezing through this little gap, you're not having to slide through it, but that yellow mark actually stays right there in the gap as we extend forward uh, and new colors are added to the, to the tip, right? So the yellow never moved and we're just adding more to the tip. This also means that as you're going uh, through little twists and turns like this, you can do this kind of follow the leader type movement. Um, and so you can make arbitrary shapes of your body without having to push off the environment to, uh, to advance. Okay, so that's kind of the goal of, of uh, what we were trying to realize, you know, this, this type of tip growth. So now we're gonna say, well, you know, how can you actually do this in a robotic fashion? All right, so how can we realize uh, extension from the tip uh, in a robotic system? So kind of maybe the first thing one might look at is, okay, well, let's look at how that, so, so here we have, um, you know, uh, a very small, uh, basically like a tip of a root. Um, it's actually a, a fungus um, growing. And it's, it's obviously incredible and amazing, um, but directly replicating this is really challenging, right? Um, it's very tiny. Uh, so this is only about 100 microns across. Uh, and maybe one of the most important things besides you know, trying to figure out how to do cell division and all that is it's very, very slow, right? So this video is sped up 100x and moves about 100 microns in the, in the time that we're watching, right? Okay, so what we did instead is saying, well, well can we uh, create a device that gets at this principle, right? Adding new material to tip, but does it in a way that's much easier to implement in a robotic uh, system. And so shown here is a little video of a, uh, a prototype where you see, uh, so it's just an inflated pneumatic device. You, you pump air in and it extends from the tip as it kind of unfurls or everts is what we call it. And basically by pulling back the material uh, from through the core, you can get it to, to reverse. So what's going on here? Uh, so in the full system, you actually have a pump, uh, a reel of material in the base uh, and a, a body that's pressurized. Um, so there's the reel there. Uh, as you uh, inflate it, you will get some lengthening. Um, we'll unreel the reel, and that allows the material to flow through the core and come out the tip. So this is this process eversion at the tip. Um, and then you know, it continues on uh, and continues to lengthen as you continue to unreel and pressurize the device uh, to give this pressure-driven lengthening process. Okay. So that was the basic idea of, uh, of tip growth uh, in a robotic system or, or, or tip extension. Growth is maybe, uh, maybe it's not really growing, but it's, you know, it's lengthening for sure. Um, and so then the next question we want to ask, so there's kind of a series of these, uh, of, you know, kind of adding the functionality of what we really need for a robot. So first we wanted just some tip growth. Uh, next we're saying, well, can we get significant changes in length, right? Because if you can only change 10% of your length or something, well, that's not that useful for growing down and reaching into a disaster situation. So we want significant changes of length. So um, this is just a, one slide with, with a few very simple equations. It's mostly just a scaling argument to look at, well, well what kind of length changes could we expect with such a system, right? So uh, if, we kinda, if we look back at the system, right, with, with our reel inside, so it has some diameter, the length of the extended portion and there's some diameter of the robot. Uh, what we can do is look at the, the, the two, two important volumes here. So there's an initial volume of the material reeled up inside, right? So this is just the volume, the, the solid volume of a cylinder, okay? And that's basically there's just a cylinder of tightly wound plastic. So it's just basically imagine the solid cylinder of plastic. That's the initial volume of plastic we have. Or, or, or fabric, whatever the skin material is. The final volume is, is the volume uh, of the solid in a thin sh uh, shell cylinder that's been extended, right? So, so you've gone from a solid um, 
cylinder into an extended tube, basically. And we're looking at how much material is in that tube, right? So that's just the circumference uh, times the thickness times the length, okay? So th those are the two shapes that we're going from. And uh, for a scaling argument, we're going to say, well, the diameter of the reel is roughly the diameter of the robot, roughly the, the depth into the page W. And we're just going to call that D, okay? And if we do that, we can equate the, the two uh, volumes at the top, and we find that the, the length of is going to be roughly d squared over 4t. Okay, so um, if we uh, plug some numbers in, the length of the, in the final situation. So if we, if we plug some numbers in of, of roughly of a prototype we have, so d is around 10 centimeters, and the thickness is about 25 microns of the film. You get, you, predicts a length change of roughly a thousand times than this initial D length, okay? So that's obviously uh, huge, and so we wanted to test that. So this is a prototype on the right, um, uh, and we're gonna grow it out here. So as it uh, is inflated and unreeled, it's extending down this hallway. You can see the reel right there, and you can see its diameter is decreasing as the material comes out. And here's the, the body at the end, so 72 meters long, which um, since the, the initial diameter was around seven centimeters, we do indeed see this thousand X uh, change in length, which is definitely sufficient for you know, accessing locations um, uh, in disaster situations. Now obviously you are more limited in the length you can go compared to a mobile robot, and um, that's definitely a trade-off in these systems. But you know, for within a working region of 70 meters or so, uh, we should have good access. Okay, so the kind of this next uh, um, question of you know functionality is is the uh, is high speed. So can how fast can we move? Okay. So this is a video of uh, the robot, and I'm going to pause it and, and play it in a second because it happens very quickly. So the robot's going to come from the right of your screen towards these wooden um, pins. And there it goes. So it moves uh, roughly 10 meters per second. We've, we've gone faster. Um, basically, it has almost no mass. So it accelerates almost uh, instantaneously, which is also kind of a fun uh, behavior. This is it slowed down. Um, you're basically just limited by how, how fast you can get air into the thing. So that's it. Uh, this is that eighth speed. Moving. So it's kind of fun. I mean, obviously, it's not really a fair comparison because uh, the plants do lots of other things, too. But uh, you can plot your uh, lengthening rate versus kind of the pressure you put into it, and you can see robots versus plants roughly a million times faster. Okay, so we can uh, lengthen the tip, we can uh, show significant length changes, and we can do them relatively quickly. Uh, and so kind of the final piece for functionality is uh, autonomous steering. So, so can we control the direction of growth? So we went through a bunch of different ways of trying to do this. So for instance, you can use pull tendons. These are tricky. They tend to buckle it at the base instead of giving you a nice uniform curve. You can do uh, pneumatic muscles along the side, which, you know, they can work. There's a nice curve, but sometimes you get kind of undesirable failures like that. Um, we tried lots of things. So uh, this is a graveyard of designs. Uh, there's probably order of 100 or so um, designs that, that we've gone through for for different steering mechanisms. Um, after all that, so this is this tortuous path that I, that I showed at the beginning. So after all that, we, we came to uh, one solution here, which is um, this robot uh, that's driving along the table. It's got a little camera on the front, and it's right now it's turning down towards the light, uh, and then it's about to do the opposite, where the light's on the top, it's going to turn up. Basically, it's doing that by inflating the chamber on the opposite side. So it inflates the chamber on the back side, and what that's doing is it's uh, allowing that side to lengthen and curve away from the inflated side. You can talk about the details of that uh, if you're interested. Here's the camera on the tip. It's held in place by the tension of the cable because there is no tip. You can't just stick the camera to the tip. So it requires the tension in the cable uh, that runs through the core of the body to hold the camera in place. Now this is it kind of reacting to a stimulus. It has a really simple controller inside where uh, if the stimulus is you know up or to the left uh, it tries to turn that way opposite direction and if it's you know to his right or down it tries to turn that way and if it's in the center it just goes straight so with that controller and uh, the camera we just put it on a table put a light on the table and let it go 
and here's it uh, making its own decisions. It decides here to make kind of an S shape to get to the curve uh, or to get to the light. And here it's going to make kind of just a, a single curvature. Um, well, actually it kind of curves. And then once it, it gets a line, it kind of goes straighter and then it realizes it's not quite a line and, and then turns a little bit more uh, to get to the light. So there's a couple examples of it uh, uh, using a little feedback to steer towards the light. We kind of have a, a different method of steering that we use sometimes as well. So this is more like a traditional continuum robot with uh, actuators on three sides, um, and then it lengthens, right? Um, so, so this is, you can imagine, you know, kind of more like an elephant trunk type um, robot uh, with the capability of lengthening to the tip. Um, and, and this is different in the last than the last one. The last one, you know, basically locks its shape in as it's going. Um, this one is, is free to, to change its shape in real time, but also has more, you know, has limitations um, in that it can't create shapes uh, arbitrarily. Okay, so with those, uh, with those kind of properties um, that we, we've uh, realized in this robot, what can we do? Um, so these are just a few videos of things that we've had the robot um, uh, uh, accomplish. So this is it growing through some sticky paper. Uh, so these are really hard to pull apart, um, but because it's not moving, it's able to move through quickly. It's a really uh, messy experiment growing through uh, white glue. Uh, this is it growing through nails. Notice the nails kind of poke it, uh, but self-seal, and so it doesn't rip it open because it's not moving forward uh, through that. We'll put those all in a row, and uh, it grows to the mall, and then up a wall of ice, and then it actually spits out a sensor at the end, so it can pull things through it body and deliver them when necessary. Uh, this is an example of it squeezing through a little gap. Um, and like we said before, because it doesn't have to slide through the gap, it can get through very narrow things and then extend out the other side and keep growing. And of course, since it's um, made out of air or filled with air, it's able to uh, go across water and pop out at the end. Then. And then finally, uh, just like the vine we saw in the beginning, you can put little sticky feet on it and it can climb up vertical walls. And then there's kind of another group of things they can do, you know, forming uh, 3D pathways um, with its body. So this is a, kind of a disaster situation where it's going into a, a locked room and turning off a valve. So it makes a little hook shape, grabs the valve, and, and turns it off. Uh, it can also make structures passing through the ceiling. So this is uh, above the ceiling, you know, if you have like a drop ceiling, a tile ceiling in a room, where the duct works above, this is it growing through. Uh, this is the point of view perspective here. As it moves through there, a little bit dizzying, but uh, shows you a little bit of what it's seeing. Um, and then what's neat here is it's actually able to pull cables through. Um, so, so with that, you can you know route a cable through a ceiling or a wall or something like that. Is it uh, showing its ability to lift things? So this is it growing under a 75 kilogram crate, uh, inflating and saving the world. And then uh, you can also fill it with a combination of water and air um, and grow towards a fire. So it's kind of here is like a self-sensing uh, mechanism. So as it grows over the fire, the fire melts a hole. And then throughout that, through that hole blows out the air water mixture and uh, puts the fire out. And then finally, you can you know, build these 3D structures into kind of arbitrary shapes. Here we're just doing a, a, a helix and uh, we've metalized it. Um, so we can send uh, signals out with this as well. Okay, so uh, we're kind of at the, the point here where we've gone from this initial problem we sought to solve to the solution um, of the tip extending pneumatic robot. And it was at this point, after we'd published this work and um, gotten around a little bit, a doctor reached out to us, um, Dr. Drover, and he, he said, um, well, uh, you know, he thinks this technology would be really helpful in something that he sees as a big challenge in his field. Um, he's an anesthesiologist. And that is uh, the problem. So this is our, our problem two here. Uh, that's the problem of emergency or non-expert intubation. So this is putting a, a tube into someone's lungs. Um, this is often done uh, in, in the hospital under very, you know, calm situations by experts like him who do it, you know, a few times a day, so you know, hundreds or even thousands of times a year. They're very good at it. Um, but in uh, an ambulance or something, this is rarely done, and when it is done, uh, the, the success rate is very low. 
Okay, so it's around 50%. Uh, so he sees this as a huge problem um, in the field. Uh, like I said, so EMTs and ambulance. Another interesting application, which is um, recently presenting itself, is, is in the potential of, of an epidemic overrunning the medical system, it, it could become required that um, non-experts perform intubation as well. Um, so these are a couple of examples where this, this, uh, this problem is very relevant. So to give you a little more background on, on what this entails, uh, so this is kind of a cross-sectional view of the path that the tube has to go uh, to get into the trachea and down into the lungs. All right, so it's, it's this bit of a tortuous path. And the other thing to note is that your body is designed such that any solid thing that goes down the throat goes into the esophagus, which is the tube in the back there. So you have to kind of trick it. There's a flap down, you know, there covering over your, your uh, tracheal opening. You have, to, you have to do some uh, kind of maneuvering to get yourself into the trachea and not into the esophagus. So this is the state of the art. Um, it looks kind of like a medieval torture device, and it's been used for about uh, 60, 70 years now without really much modification. They've added uh, a light and a little video uh, stream to the end of it so you, so you can see a little easier now. Um, and I'm going to show a couple of videos now of the process. So these are all, just so you know, and don't get too concerned, these are all um, uh, medical residents uh, with an expert right next to them. So even though they're struggling, uh, the expert is monitoring everything and making sure nothing goes wrong. But this is just to give you an idea of what a challenge this is. So, so they're trying to put in uh, the tube in their right hand. They've got in the left hand this, this tool, and they've got the video going, and, and that's what you see. So if you can tell me where the tracheal opening is versus the esophagus and where to push your tube, uh, then you're better at this than I am. Um, again, another one where it's just kind of this uh, mush of flesh. Um, and so this is really challenging uh, to do. This is a, an example where there's a little bit of uh, blood on the, on the camera, which makes it even harder to see. So again, in emergency situations, this can be really challenging. Um, and so um, this just gives you a little idea of, of, of how challenging this process is. And if you're imagining you're an EMT and you maybe only try this a couple times a year, you can see why uh, your success rate might be 50%, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard problem to do. Okay, so our question we want to ask was, uh, can we create a conduit to the lungs um, with a fail-safe, so, so it's, it's very reliable, uh, plus easy-to-use device, right? So it's not, it doesn't take this expertise. Um, and especially in a high stress situation. So uh, in these, in the videos we saw, you know, the doctor was there, everything was under control, but in an ambulance or other situations, uh, we want to make it really easy and uh, very little room for user error. So that's the goal. So this is a video of a, a recent prototype we made. So this is a head model. It's kind of cut away so you can see what's going on. Uh, we have the device uh, inside this little white um, area. Here we have uh, external air, but this would, in the final version, have a um, compressed air uh, cartridge. We're going to inflate the air. We're going to see the, the tube growing down. It's a little hard to see, but it's growing down into the esophagus. At this point, there's a branch that comes out that then goes up into the trachea um, under the flap and down into what would be the lungs down there. So uh, in a second, he's going to pull this out, and you, you can see uh, what's, what's going on there. Um, and uh, as it comes out, you can see how there is a, a main uh, branch of it that went down into the esophagus. And then off the side of that was the piece that came down into the, uh, the lungs there. So it looks kind of like this. Now you'll see that there's also a couple other branches. So what we've done is we've, we actually designed three branches into it. Uh, what this does is it allows whichever branch is aligned with the tracheal opening is the one that will come out. The other two will remain uh, uh, in place. So it allows us to, to, to deal with different morphology. Here's a hot off the uh, press uh, workbench not so pretty video that my student just sent um, of a, a tightened device. So this is the whole device right there um, and kind of more of a mouthpiece design. Um, and I'm going to, well, this can happen relatively quickly when you work on the speed here, it's maybe a little too fast. 
basin hit the air, you'll see it grow down through the, the trachea um, as he hits the air now. Yep, there he goes. <laughs> and, uh, and now you see down to the right, we have lungs on this model and you can see the lungs are inflating down there. And the bottommost bag, that blue bottommost bag is uh, the stomach, which is not inflating, which is key, right? You don't wanna put air into the stomach. Okay, so uh, we also took this uh, up to the Sanford uh, Cadaver Lab, and uh, this is an image of it uh, in real tissue. Um, so it's actually going through the vocal cords um, with success there. So that was a, a huge uh, step forward for us. And, uh, you know, kind of one last stat here uh, on this project. Um, so if you kind of calculate from the, the failure rates uh, of, of the current intubation, and the number of uh, emergency intubations that are done, um, there could be on the order of you know, 500,000 preventable deaths per year um, with this technology. Now, obviously that would be if this worked every time and all that. So this is the kind of the most you could, you could potentially get to, right? And everyone adopted it. So obviously that's, that's optimistic, but it's nice to know kind of the, the range we're talking about. Now, of course, this doesn't include the situation if you know, COVID-19 or another epidemic uh, uh, requires the use of non-expert uh, intubation, which is a whole other um, thing we could potentially consider. And then one last thing to note here, which is interesting, is that as you saw in that last black one, uh, the mouth is closed and sealed off during intubation, which is quite different than you saw in the videos when everything's open and uh, things are being aerosolized. And so this is actually a big issue in uh, intubation in the hospital right now. Um, of, of COVID patients because it puts the medical staff at quite a bit of risk uh, when you're doing the intubation uh, and releasing the pathogen into the air. So potentially this could have um, some benefits even in routine hospital intubations um, if it's protecting the, the staff from getting infected. Uh, so from that, we've uh, started a little company, uh, Vine Devices Incorporated, and we are uh, moving forward with this and trying to uh, see uh, where it can go. Um, so as just a little recap, uh, we started with this problem of search and rescue. Uh, we came to the solution of this tip extending device. And from there, uh, we looked back and realized that with some uh, small changes, we could um, potentially affect uh, a different application area um, of emergency uh, intubation. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for your attention and I'll take any questions. Yeah, that's a really remarkable uh, robot and also really useful uh, application. And I, there's a question from the attendee. Uh, basically, uh, they ask, uh, what are the material selection constraints for the wine-like robot? Yeah, no, very good question. So uh, the, the key parameters you would like is it to have a very high hoop stress so that you can put a large pressure inside without it um, exploding. Uh, but at the same time, you need it to be very supple uh, or, or, or relatively easy to do this unfurling motion. So this is why we found that actually fabrics are one of the best options because the fabric allows you to have nice hoop stress, but because of the individual fibers, uh, yeah. allows you to unfurl nicely. Um, and uh, we use uh, waterproof or, or airproof waterproof fabrics for that instead of silicone um, uh, impregnation. Yeah, also, uh, I have one question, like uh, for the incubation application, uh, do you see invasion, like uh, any challenges to make this really practical, uh, maybe an, as an alternative to a conventional Macintosh uh, incubation tubes? Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. So right now, our biggest uh, hurdle we think is FDA. So anytime you come up with new a new idea that is quite a bit different than the, the current, uh, it takes more time to the FDA. So, so we expect we might need to do some um, uh, clinical testing. Um, luckily, uh, we're working on this with this, this Dr. Drover. He's been really involved with this whole project and he's an expert actually. This is one of the main things he does is run clinical trials for other people's devices. Um, so he, he's actually pretty excited to, to run this uh, uh, test. Um, I, right, right now, you know, with the testing in uh, human tissue, we, we, we've shown it's it's able to access the lungs. I think the bigger question for us now is whether FDA um, has any issues with how it's quite different than the current technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I think uh, your answer also uh, addressed one question from my audience about uh, like uh, what are the main challenges or medical yeah. applications of the wine like robot, right? Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, I feel this is the most uh, uh, remarkable robot I see in this year. I think uh, <laughs> yeah. both the design and also application, I really like that. And also yeah. we are writing some review paper about that, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool, yeah. I think, uh, um, I think uh, uh, we are almost uh, done with uh, our uh, workshop. And finally, I want to, uh, Kevin and I want to 